Hello, everyone, and welcome to our broadcast. We're glad you joined us today. Last week, we began with the teaching on great grace, a message that I taught at Kurt Landry's House of David in Fairland, Oklahoma. God's grace will supply your every need. But there's an entirely different level of grace that goes beyond our needs. Great grace is another plane of existence, if you will. The Bible directs us to imitate our Father God, which, we, which means we've been given power and authority to rule and reign in this world, to walk above the basic needs of life, and to supernaturally spread the Word of God throughout the earth. Great grace is on today's menu. I hope you'll stay tuned. But before we get into the Word, as always, here's Jeannie to minister to you in song. Now this is a powerful song. It's called He's a Healing Jesus. And I want to suggest to you that if you need healing, get in a position where you can receive your healing from God as Jeannie sings. Turn up the volume on your TV set or wherever you're watching. Maybe you're watching around the world via live stream. But let the Holy Spirit touch you. Here's Jeannie singing, He's a Healing Jesus. Just worship God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. His powers flow in your way. Even now, while you are calling, His glory is falling. And by His name, that sickness, it cannot stay. He's a healing Jesus. He's a healing Jesus. Oh, let His power heal.
I could think to say was get it out of the street. In fact, that was the last thing I remember saying. The next thing I remember was being put into an ambulance on a stretcher. I had absolutely no fear for I felt God's presence. The doctors wanted to put three rods in my back to support my vertebrae column, but I chose not to have the surgery. I knew in my heart that God would supernaturally take care of me. Learning to Trust God's Faithfulness is a book about Jeannie Caldwell's real life encounters with God. She shares them with you in the hope that your faith and trust in a loving Heavenly Father will increase. To order the book, Learning to Trust God's Faithfulness, call 800-264-2525 or visit our website at vtntv.com. Here's Pastor Caldwell with today's message. So that's what was going on. The people had one heart, one soul. They were in one accord. They had unity of purpose. The apostles, now this is the second thing that was going on. The apostles were giving witness of the resurrect power of God. There were signs, wonders, miracles, gifts of the Holy Ghost. There were demonstrations of the Spirit that were going on. Now look what happened as a result of these two things in harmony. They were one heart, one soul. Nobody said anything that I have is mine and you can't have it. They said just the opposite. They said what I have, what I own, if you have need of anything, it's yours. And with great power, verse 33, gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. I want you to say this out loud. Great grace was upon them all. Now, this is not sufficient grace. Remember, Paul was facing some difficulties, and he went to the Lord, and the Lord said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. It'll get you through what you're going through. Then there was another place where there was abundance of grace. That means there's enough for you and for somebody else. But here he's talking about great grace. If we want great grace, God's willingness to use his power on our behalf to a level we've never experienced before, we have to meet these two conditions. One heart, one soul, unity of purpose. Number two, the apostles have to give witness of the resurrected power of God. There has to be signs, wonders, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost. There wasn't anybody in this group that lacked anything. Think of it. There was no need. There was, there were, there was nothing in the entire congregation here that anybody lacked. Not one thing. Did you know that property is the most tenacious of institutions? That's why lawyers are necessary to settle property disputes. Even in the church, we have what is called <clears throat> intellectual property rights. You can actually own your own sermon. You can get all of the <coughs> residuals and royalties off of it. Because it came out of you, you own it. Intellectual property rights. But you have to have an attorney to write that up and it has to be enforced. Well, in 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, it tells those that are rich in this world to be willing to share. It brings about the abolition of property. Yes, you own it. I've heard preachers tell me, I've had preachers tell me, well, you don't own anything. It all belongs to God. And I asked them, I said, do you own your Bible? Yeah. Do you own the clothes you got on? Yeah. Do you own your car? Do you own your house? Do you own the property? Yeah. Well, then you do own something. God originated it all. He created it all. But he gave it to you. Deuteronomy 8.18 says he gives you the power to get wealth. 
Jesus told his disciples in Luke 10, he said, you have been given the power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Do you remember the storm that Jesus stopped on the Sea of Galilee and a storm rose up? I've been on it many times and the storm can come up real quick. And <laughs> They were f afraid for their lives. Do you remember that? And they went and woke Jesus up. <laughs> he was asleep in the bow of the boat in a storm. Now, I can identify with that. I spent six years in the Navy, two years at sea on two different ships, and we wrote, rode out a hurricane one time. Now, when you're 20 years old and you have no sense and you're stupid, you're not afraid of anything. So, you know, we were confined to below decks and we had these straps that fit across our legs and across our chest to hold us in our canvas racks so it wouldn't throw us out on the deck. I wanted to see the hur hurricane. So I unfastened my, and I ran up topside and lashed a broom handle across the bosun's locker. I was a bosun's mate. And I watched that hurricane. I was hollering and screaming and, you know, whoo. I mean, the waves were 30 feet high. The radio antennas are slapping the water. I mean, it was a ride. It was, it was really something. I was having fun. Well, we would sleep through those things. Eventually, you get used to the sea and, you know, nothing bothers you. Jesus was asleep in the bow of the boat. They woke him up. said, Master, don't you care? We're dying here. Jesus spoke to the wind, to the waves. He said, Peace, be still. The wind calmed down. The waves calmed down. Turned around to the disciples and said, Why didn't you use your faith? In other words, why didn't you take care of the storm? Why didn't you speak to it? Now, Greek, uh, Rick Renner is a Greek scholar, uh, pastors in Moscow, Russia. And he said what Jesus actually did, if you wanted to act it out, when he stood up, he as much as said to the wind and the sea, shh. Everybody did that together. Shh. has a calming effect, doesn't it? That's what mama say to babies. Shh. You see, what Jesus was actually doing was saying to the wind and the sea, stop that. Go back to the normal process for which you were created, which is not destruction. What does that tell you about tornadoes and hurricanes and earthquakes? They're perversions. They're driven by demon spirits. It's not God using them to teach us a lesson. You know, I hear people all the time say, well, I heard one preacher say on television, he said, now there's a hurricane coming to the East Coast. He said, and God's fed up with the sin on the East Coast, and so he sent this hurricane. Now let's pray. That's what he said. So I listened to see what he prayed. It's kind of stupid to pray against God sending a hurricane if you believe he's sending it. And what did the disciples say when Jesus rebuked the, sin, the wind and the, and the waves and said, why didn't you use your faith? They looked at him and they said, what manner of man is this? He's the God-man. He's the example. Ephesians 5.21 says, Be ye therefore followers uh, of God as dear children. So we're to imitate our father. Did you know that children always imitate their fathers? Good, bad, or not, they imitate the father. Fathers wonder sometimes, I wonder how my kid got so rebellious. Look in the mirror, Dad. He learned it at home. She learned it at home. So Jesus examples for us and other scriptures example for us that we have been given power. We've been given authority. Now keep reading with me down to verse 34, Acts 4, 34. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands and houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold. 
Did they own these houses and lands? If they didn't own them, they couldn't have sold them, but that'd be fraud. You can't sell something you don't own. So they owned them. And they sold them. And they brought the money and laid it down, verse 35, at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made to every man according as he had need. Can you imagine a congregation where there's no lack, there's no need, because anytime anybody has a need, it's met by the congregation. Now, I've seen this happen. In our church, when we first started, we were believing to build our new facility that we've been in for over 30 years now. The Lord had showed us 12 acres of land up on a hill, and he wanted us on top. Pastor Landry and Christy, Dr. Miller, you all have you all been there. And it's up on a hill. And before we got the parking lot paved and the driveways paid, when it rained, it was a mud hole. Gravel, mud. The ladies who would come to church would wear their tennis shoes to walk up the hill. And then they'd take their tennis shoes off and leave them in the hall and put on their high heels. <laughs> the Lord told us to build it and pay for it as we went, which is what we did. There was a banker that he was willing to loan us the money, but the Lord said, no, I don't want you to borrow the money. I want you to build it and pay for it as you go because if you can't build a building, you can't reach a city. And if you can't reach a city, I have to get somebody else. Everything's relevant. When the Lord uh, tried to get me to, excuse me, Lord, uh, when the Lord tried to get me to be delivered from a poverty mindset, he told me that I had to pay full price for a suit of clothes. And I thought that was pretty ridiculous. Why have to pay full price for a suit of clothes? In those days, in the early 70s, you could buy, I could buy three double-knit suits for $100. He said, I want you to go find the most expensive suit in the, in the uh, department store and pay full price for it. Well, the most expensive suit I could find was a Hart Schaffner and Marks, three Hebrew children. And I would pay $350 for this suit. I could buy five suits for that. Why pay $350 for one suit? He said, if you can't pay full price for a suit, you can't uh, build a building. And if you can't build a building, you can't take a city. He said, and while I'm at it, when you go to the restaurant, I want you to quit shopping down the right-hand side of the menu and shop down the left side of the menu. Oh, the right side is where the price is. He said, when you go to the restaurant to eat, you always buy the cheapest price. You don't even look at the food. You look at the price. He said, I want you to stop doing that. This was hard for me because I was raised with a poverty mindset. It's the way I was raised. It was my father and his father before him. And, you know, my father was of the greatest generation. They went through the Great Depression, fought in World War II, came home, rebuilt America. And well, you know, everybody saved everything. They didn't throw anything away. My grandfather had the whole side of his garage papered with the license plates off of every car he'd ever owned. <laughs> he kept the sawdust that he would cut. He made his own furniture. He'd cut the sawdust on the floor. He'd scrape it up, put it in a jar. And I'd say, why do you keep the sawdust? He said, you never know when you might need some sawdust. <laughs> so when you're raised like that, If I'm stepping on your toes, just lift them up off the floor a little bit because <laughs> it's going to get worse or better, however you look at it. So God was trying to teach me and train me because what he wanted to do through me, he couldn't do with me having this poverty mindset. So I began to learn, and I found a suit, $300. I bought it. I don't know how I bought it, but I did. 
And I began to see what God was trying to get me to do. Okay, we're building our church. In the beginning, it looked a lot like what you're building next door. We had, we'd finish a part of it, and, and we, the, the steel was sticking out, and then we'd finish another part of it, and we'd keep on going. We asked everybody in our church to believe God for $1,000. And when we finally got it built and moved in, we had built it. It's 43,000 square feet under roof, three levels. And we had built it for $12 a square foot. That's almost unheard of, unbelievable. Of course, that was 30 years ago too. You know what the interest rates, if you borrow money to build a building from a bank, you know what the interest rates were in, the, in 80, 81, 82 18%. God knows what, God's a good businessman. He knows what he's doing. And he said, I don't want you to borrow the money. I want you to build it and pay for it as you win. So we finally did it, got it finished, but we had a valuable learning lesson. Everybody in the congregation believed God for $1,000. Some of them got extra jobs. One couple painted their neighbor's house. They paid him $1,000. One man got a paper route. Got up every morning, 4 or 5 o'clock, and threw papers. Others knew certain things they were supposed to do. Seed, sowing, blessing, believing. Everybody did what they knew to do, what they could do. And one Sunday morning, I noticed uh, as we were in praise and worship, there was a, a family over here, and uh, it was a mother and two daughters and one son. And they were standing over here, and there was, there was no father in this family. It was a single mom and three kids. And I knew that they didn't have $1,000, and they were lifting up their hands and worshiping God and and I watched this gentleman in the back of the church back there. I knew who he was. He was a businessman. He was an investment banker. And I saw him looking, watching like this. Be sure to watch next week's broadcast as we continue this message. I hope that message, Great Grace, has ministered grace to you and shown you, given you revelation knowledge of great grace in your life. Now, I'd like to pray with you. You know, the Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith. You have to use your faith to access God's grace. God's already done everything for us, but we have to believe it and receive it. Would you just stop what you're doing right now? Close your eyes and pray with me. If you've never done this, just pray it out loud. Just say, Jesus, I believe you're God's son. I believe God raised you from the dead. Come into my heart, Jesus. Save me now. Take away my sin. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me now. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it in your heart, said it with your mouth, Jesus came in. I'd like you to have this book. It's on the screen right now called God Loves You. This book will help you get started right in your life with the Lord. It's easy to get. Just log on to vtntv.com. You can download it for free if you like or call 1-800-264-2525. Tell the operator you just prayed with Pastor Caldwell and you'd like that book and we'll send it to you free. We're here to pray and stand in agreement with you if you have a prayer request or a praise report. We want to hear it. So email me, happycaldwell at vtntv.com. You can also call 1-800-264-2525 to send in your prayer requests. So we're looking forward to hearing from you. One more thing before we go. You can get this teaching on great grace on your own CD. I want you to watch this product offer and then I'll be right back. God's grace is not a license to just do anything you want and God will forgive you. His grace is so much more than a get-out-of-jail-free card. In fact, it's God's highest manifestation of His love. 
The early church was a great witness of the grace of God. He showed His grace through no want or poverty among them. But there are other types of grace with God. His sufficient grace will get you through your weaknesses. His abundant grace empowers you to reign in life with more than enough. For just $20, you can get your copy of this series by Happy Caldwell, Great Grace. Order this four CD set by calling 1-800-264-2525 and ask for offer number 33060. You know, the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If you want to know more about grace, especially great grace, and I would really encourage you to order your copy of Great Grace. You'll have your own CDs that you can listen to at your leisure. Join me again on Twitter if you like, happy underscore Caldwell, and be sure to join Jeannie and me next week, same time, and remember, happy is the man that finds wisdom and the man that gets understanding. At Happy Caldwell Ministries, we are helping people, changing lives, and making a difference. We'd love for you to take part in what we're doing. Please consider making Happy Caldwell Ministries a part of your regular giving. Help us continue touching people and making a difference in their lives. To make a donation or to contact this ministry, write to Happy Caldwell Ministries, P.O. Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221. You may also call 501-223-2525. Today's program is available to watch online. To watch this video on demand, log on to vtntv.com and click watch. You may also order a copy of today's show on DVD by calling 1-800-264-2525. Ask for the offer number on the screen.